I'm here in Honolulu, Hawaii at night in a night shoot, but there is the city of Honolulu and Diamond Head's there, but you can't see it. And uh, doing an interview with my friend and colleague, Dr. Shadi Habal of the Institute for Astronomy. And uh, she uh, had a uh, great work, this is a great opportunity to do research for the 2017 eclipse, uh, which was a, a fantastic opportunity for solar research. And uh, Shadi has shared with me so many things uh, that I felt I, I needed to ask her and put it on tape and that we could share it with people. But Shadi, I want to ask you, uh, how did you get started? Where did you go to school uh, to, to study science? So I did my undergraduate in, at the University of Damascus in physics and mathematics. Then I did my master's at the American University of Beirut in nuclear physics. And then I went to the University of Cincinnati where I did my PhD in physics. So it wasn't until I went as a postdoctoral fellow to board Boulder that I ended up starting to do research in solar physics. Solar. And that was the beginning of my uh, passion for oh, solar physics. Okay, yeah. and when did you uh, start to do solar research on your own and go on the ground and look at a solar eclipse, study there? Yeah, so my first eclipse expedition was in 95 and it was drawn by curiosity to try to observe the corona during an eclipse and to look at it through the eyes of two ions, based, uh, that, uh, iron ions that had lo lost several electrons. And uh, each one of them has a different uh, temperature sensitivity. So we wanted to explore how the temperature in the corona changes. But, now, mm. but why did you get to that? Because here you were at Boulder. What were you studying there? And what made you lead to that? So you already knew. And was there a better way to do this with the solar eclipse uh, uh, technology? What happened? Somehow the segue. Well, uh, they, there were lots of space-based observations. But they couldn't tell us the whole story because the, intense, the light from the extreme ultraviolet that was being used for space-based uh, uh, instrumentation uh, cut off very quickly beyond the surface of the sun. So you only saw a short extension, but you didn't see it very far away. And uh, we, uh, we knew that from eclipses, we looking at images of eclipses, you can see the light really far away from the sun. So it, uh, I was curious to try something, you know, to see what kind of physics I can get from looking at the sun during total solar eclipses that was different from space. And you found, was it different? Yes, it was very different. We found that uh, these, uh, the light that was coming from these iron ions uh, extended to several solar radii above the surface. And then we recognized that the reason being is because uh, these, uh, this light uh, in, in the visible part of the spectrum is produced f from um, the ions uh, reacting to the light that's coming from the sun, not necessarily just by collisions with electrons. Therefore, it, uh, the, their intensity lasted much longer for longer distances. For a particle mm. physics, they're going to understand that. Or physics, mm. for me, it's a little harder to to understand what it is there. But uh, I, this is related to why the temperature of the corona is very hot, right? Yes. Uh, so we were interested in trying to find some clues as to what really made the temperature be so hot. And what we found is that the temperature distribution varied from one part of the corona to another, and uh, we were. Uh, we were focused mostly on iron elements, but subsequently, as we did more and more eclipse observations, especially for the latest one in 2017, I wanted to explore uh, the chemical composition of the corona by looking at other elements other than iron. Okay, mm. so uh, it, it, something that, that I remember you saying to me uh, earlier, uh, you're studying the chemical composition and also properties. Mm. It, it, you're now doing more into chemical composition of the, of the corona? Yes, so uh, the chemical composition is directly linked also to the properties of the corona. It's just, it's almost like you're finding new clues, like you're a detective and you want new fingerprints and these new fingerprints are looking at different elements in the corona and how what kind of light they're, they're giving us so all these are different fingerprints of the processes that keep the corona hot now this this period you, you started in 95 and then uh, i suppose subsequently you, you probably 
went to every total solar eclipse after that, at least tried to, yes. right, depending mm -hmm. on funding. And space uh, spacecraft were also being deployed. Mm -hmm. So you're working in tandem, mm -hmm. working together, and maybe some are showing more than others. But it's true that recently in ground-based observations of, of total solar eclipses are showing uh, great data that mm -hmm. maybe is not showing in, in, in spacecraft. Is that true? Yes, because uh, with the spacecraft that are currently uh, operational, you have uh, either the extreme ultraviolet, which I told you uh, cuts off very close to the sun, so you lose information very quickly as to what happens to the, to the, to the particle, particles afterwards. Uh, with the eclipse, you can start from the solar surface and go out to several uh, uh, radii, solar radii. And at present, there isn't any spacecraft uh, whether or, or, or a telescope on the ground that has this capability. It's just because during a total solar eclipse, the background sky is dimmed so much that you can see the corona like you see stars at night or you can see, uh, you know, the moon at night. Mm. Now, August uh, 2017. This was a great opportunity. I know for me, when I was 14 years old, uh, 1979, I saw my first total solar eclipse with the Vanderbilt Planetarium and the Hayden Planetarium in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And immediately, when's the next total solar eclipse in America? August 21st, 2017. 38 years later, I had to wait to see my first total solar eclipse in the United States. Uh, this is a big one in that it's a coast-to-coast -coast eclipse in the United States. Uh, we're, we're here, we're doing our research in the U.S., but coast-to-coast, -coast, you're giving us this, this much path for us, uh, 90 minutes for the, the shadow of the moon to, to cross, and, and technically being on ground, 90 minutes of possible real changing time uh, on the corona. Uh, tell me about what your plans were, how long have you had them, and uh, what, what were you able to do? Uh, I know there's probably a lot of things you weren't able to do, but I want to know, what, what were you able to do? So we started to plan for this eclipse in 2012, and I realized that this was a fantastic opportunity to have multiple observing sites across the country. A minimum of 10 was my original plan, and to have uh, identical instrumentation to maximize our chances of observing, but also to see the variations in the corona, both in uh, uh, temperature or, or uh, you know, changes in the structures in the corona over these 90 minutes. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we didn't get enough funding for this more ambitious plan, so we ended up with five observing sites from Oregon to, uh, uh, to Nebraska. And uh, what we found... How much in, time is that, by the way? Uh, about uh, uh, 30 minutes. 30 minutes of yeah. change in yeah. dynamics. 38 to, okay. to, yeah, to be... Yeah. So uh, what we found is we found... Um, uh, we had the instrument, our instrumentation had improved tremendously since our first observations. We had very, very fine uh, resolution images and we could see exactly how the distribution of the temperature in the corona varied from one place to another, how the different iron lines were uh, emitting uh, light in different regions and by comparing the images you can really see the distinction between them. Mm. Uh, can you tell me why is this important to, to, to look at this? I mean, is this related to space weather? Space weather, space, sorry, space weather important? Uh, well, you know, what, what are we learning? What can we learn? How does this relate to everything? I know the sun is a star, mm -hmm. and it's all the stars and all astronomy, so there has to be that. But uh, also that how it affects us here on Earth. Uh, Okay. Right. So uh, the corona is not just limited to, to the sun. It basically expands and escapes from the sun in the form of what uh, Gene Parker gave it the first name, the solar wind. And this solar wind has, uh, has properties that change as a function of time or even uh, as a function of time. There are uh, sometimes it's very fast, uh, 800 kilometers per second. Sometimes it's slow, two or 300 kilometers per second. So we really want to go back to the, to the source at the sun to understand where this wind is coming from and what is causing it to sometimes be fast, sometimes be slow. When it's fast, its uh, impact on the Earth's magnetic environment is very strong and it can uh, enable uh, energetic particles to penetrate not just the auroral regions, 
uh, the polar regions, but to go to much lower latitudes. And, the, uh, and also, uh, this impact can also affect our communication satellites. So, it's not just a understanding a fundamental physical process or physical system in our universe, but it's also trying to understand the implications for our civilization. Oh, okay. Mm. Um, in, in this eclipse, uh, I remember you, you mentioned to me uh, personally that um, you, there was, well, actually, I saw it in the AAS conference. Uh, you announced that prominences, which is something that we could see uh, with our naked eye during a total solar eclipse, something I was uh, screaming about in my flight, uh, Alaska Flight 870, out the window. I could see the prominences. The, the reddish tint, the, the pinkish hue of the chromosphere is actually visible during mm -hmm. totality. And um, I believe that in your observations, you discovered something relating to prominences with the corona. Mm -hmm. There's been a, a, a correlation, or at least... Or, yeah, so what we found is uh, you can think of, of uh, that prominences are the very, very cool uh, structures in the corona. The gas is at uh, 10,000 degrees instead of a million, but it's a hundred times denser. So the big uh, surprise or question or uh, mystery is how does this gas that's so dense and so cool uh, protrude into the corona and survive there? without getting to be hotter. It's almost like you put a, an ice cube in the oven and it stays as an ice cube. <laughs> so it's, it's that strange. And we found from our eclipse observations that the prominence is always surrounded by the hottest material in the corona. And so these prominences, they flicker, they change a lot with time, and sometimes they start to stretch out away from the sun. And as they stretch, they, they pull with them these arches that surround them. And eventually they form something we call coronal mass ejection, these huge bubbles that escape from the sun and, and expand into interplanetary space. And these are significant because yes. if one were to come directly toward us, and we hear this on the news and such, mm. it could affect us here, our communications and things? Yes, it could impact our communication satellites. It could lead to energetic particles penetrating lower down into the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, so, from a technical point of view, the damage could be significant. It's worse than a major tornado or hurricane or any, because it can be much more widespread. So, it behooves us to try to understand where this is happening at the sun. Can we predict them and can we uh, protect the communication satellites if we know that there's a coronal mass ejection that's going to be, uh, that's directed directly at the Earth? And we, we have some, like we can detect it, but we have some time when it does come. But, yes, but, but if we predict, it's still very difficult to predict. Still very difficult because to predict. these uh, prominences, they're flickering, they're moving up and down and so on. But you can never tell when it's going to finally take off. Just all of it, it sud happens suddenly. So uh, this is very unique in that uh, mm -hmm. now we can actually pretty, I mean, it, this is your preliminary findings, but you see it's pretty close, sure, that we could say that the, the prominence is the cooler material and then this hot material around it, and that it is most definitely related to the coronal mass ejection mm -hmm. and, and not there. And um, why is it that the corona is like hot, it, it, like uh, it's a million degrees and two million degrees, depending on what uh, which ionization, and it's when it's even close to the sun, it's at a million degrees, and then so far away, it's still a million or two million degrees. Uh, yeah, the temperature drops with the expansion of the solar wind, but it drops by a factor of ten uh, because it's uh, the gas is cooling as it's expanding. Uh, but uh, one of uh, the mysteries, the other mysteries we have solved with the eclipse observations, is to figure out what happens to this prominence material as it uh, snaps and moves away, you know. Does it just uh, fall back down to the sun or does it keep on expanding? And when it expands, what happens to it? So what we found from the eclipse observations is it expands and it stays cool. It keeps its identity. It doesn't care about the, the gas around it being very hot. E wait, even after it snaps? And yes, yeah. And, and snapping is this just Straight. rubber band twisting of magnetic field lines and they yeah. actually if you're turning and turning they uh, they're being twisted around what's causing them to twist around so much is magnetic uh, people think that it's mostly the motions of the gas below the visible surface of the sun 
and the gas uh, it's uh, it's very dense and you have uh, ionized gas that's moving and uh, creating currents and creating magnetic fields and the magnetic fields are moving so they're causing then this twisting you know the sources are moving and then it's causing the twisting further up in the corona and they snap oh. and then they go out and this potentially CME mm. and it can come towards us um, what are your plans for uh, the next total solar? Cycle? There's, there's going to be another one in two in next year, 2019. Yes. And uh, is that so, South America? Is yes. Like? Yeah. So our our goal is to observe uh, the corona uh, to to probe uh, deeper into its chemical composition, and to try to uh, observe uh, elements that are uh, other than iron, for example, argon or silicon or or sulfur and to, to try to see how these other elements behave. So now we kind of have an idea how iron behaves, the different ionization states of iron. Now we want to explore other chemicals because these are the fingerprints that are going to tell us what the sun really is doing. And by knowing uh, mm. the chemical composition, perhaps we'll have a better understanding of how the sun is really ticking mm -hmm. and, uh, and further and what's going then possibly for prediction. Yes. And okay, uh, well, um, <sighs> to end it there. And <laughs> I want to thank you very much, Dr. Shadi Habal, for uh, for this interview. And it's my uh, pleasure. Uh, uh -huh. and, uh, what a beautiful night! I don't know if you can see Honolulu, but it's absolutely gorgeous here. And the moon, the gibbous moon, we had a total lunar eclipse just uh, a couple of nights ago, and uh, we were battling clouds, but we did see it, and there were actually uh, great uh, breaks in it where, where we saw it. But it's it's, it's coming up now, the the moon. But um, thank you very much, Dr. Habal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.